Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that even when these words were penned, you intended for us to be looking at it this morning, that you have a purpose to achieve amongst us. And we simply pray that you would open our eyes to see Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus is incredible. He has rescued us in the most amazing way. And it is a complete understatement to say that he is overqualified for the role. He is the goat, the greatest of all time, if you're familiar with that language. And remembering that he is the Remembering all of that is the best way to avoid the stupidity of setting aside what Jesus has done for us and instead putting our confidence in the impossible task of attempting to save ourselves. I'm going to begin with some images, uh, perhaps of uh, being stupid enough to use the wrong tool for the job. And I want those images to kind of sink in because they're in a tiny way a picture of what we're being warned to avoid here spiritually. If you're new to Newcastle, let me point out to you the tallest building in the city. It's Hadrian's Tower. It's 26 floors, big for Newcastle. Uh, The Shard in London is almost four times taller than that. Now imagine trying to dig the foundations for a building like that using a teaspoon while powerful excavators sit idle on the side of the building site. Well, imagine trying to cook a meal for a group this size using only a small tea light candle when you've got a top of the range cooker and catering kitchen at your disposal. Or imagine a large ship attempting, attempting to navigate through treacherous waters at night using only a small battery operated kid's torch while the ship's sophisticated navigation system sits unused. Or stepping down the helicopters and the fire engines and fighting a forest fire with that tiny water pistol from last year's Christmas cracker. Do you get the idea? That's in a tiny way what it's like to set aside the beauty and the wonder of Jesus and to cling to something far lesser than him. That's what Paul is showing us here. Jesus is incredible. He has rescued us in the most amazing way. So the message is trust him and trust him alone and do not look for something extra or something other than Jesus for your salvation. The good news of Christianity, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has done everything that is needed to rescue us. And the gospel tells us that Jesus is the only way by which we can be saved. Look with me at verses 13 and 14, just a bit earlier than the passage we're looking at this morning. He, that is Jesus, has delivered us from the domain, that's the Father, sorry, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has done all of this through Jesus. And Jesus is the creator, he's the Lord over everything. He's Lord over everything that we need rescuing from. And he is far more capable of doing that than he needs to be. His rescue is complete and perfect. Nothing can make it better. So keep trusting him to save you and watch out for the idea that you need anything other than Jesus. Or as Paul puts it in verse 23, do not shift from the hope of the gospel that you heard. That is the key instruction for us this morning. Do not shift from the hope of the gospel you heard. From time to time we sing a kid's song because it's like this, Jesus is number one, right at the top where he belongs. Who he is and what he's done make Jesus number one. And that is a great summary of what we see here about Jesus. Firstly, we see that Jesus is the greatest in the whole of creation. Verses 15 to 17. Let me read those again for us. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
Jesus reveals God to us. Paul begins by unveiling Jesus as the ultimate revelation of God himself. Jesus didn't just come to teach about God, he was God. Jesus, as the Son of God incarnate, born as a baby in Bethlehem, is the visible image of the invisible God. To know God, we don't need to guess what he's like. We can look at Jesus and see a perfect representation of God's character, because Jesus is God. Jesus is also supreme. The term firstborn over all creation perhaps requires some explanation. It doesn't imply that Jesus was himself created and is the greatest of created things. Instead, it declares that he is higher and greater than absolutely everything else. Just as a firstborn in a royal family holds a special status, Jesus holds the highest rank in the entire universe. He is the heir. He's supreme over all things, both in time and authority. Why? Because Jesus is the creator. Everything. When Paul says all things, he means all things in heaven and on earth, whether seen or unseen, has been brought into existence by Jesus. He's not only the creator, but he's the whole purpose of creation. Everything exists for him. He's the center of the whole universe. Jesus is also eternal. He existed before all things. He's not a created being. He is divine and has an eternal nature. He's outside of and over all of creation. Jesus is the sustainer. He didn't create the world, then step back. He's still at work, holding the universe together. And without him, it would all collapse. These are the wonderful things about Jesus that we need to hold on to, to stop us looking to lesser things. But that's not all. Not only is Jesus the greatest in creation, he's the greatest in the church, verses 18 to 20. Again, let me read those for us. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is the founder and head of the church. He's the head of the body, the church, his people. His role as the beginning and the firstborn of the dead speaks of his resurrection from the dead, but also his founding through his death and resurrection of a new creation that springs out of those who were once spiritually dead, and that includes us if we believe in Jesus. And there is no higher authority in the church than Jesus himself. Nothing else compares to him. He's the source of God's fullness. In Jesus, all the fullness of God dwells. That means we need nothing more from God than he has already given to us in Jesus Christ. No one can offer more than God's fullness, which is found in Christ. And wonderfully, he's the reconciler. He's the one who brings peace between us and God. And the vertical relationship between God and his creation has been damaged due to our rebellion against him, the results of which are chaos and fighting and divisions that we see in the world. And not only is our relationship with God needing to be restored, our horizontal relationships are also far from peaceful. But through Jesus' death on the cross, God took the initiative to fix things between us. And so Jesus has made it possible for there to be peace between us and God and between one another. This is Jesus. This is the one who is the creator and Lord of everything. He is the one who has rescued us and he is more than capable of doing so. His rescue is complete and perfect. Nothing can make it better. So brothers and sisters, keep trusting him to save you and watch out for the idea that you need anything other than Jesus. Paul also wants us to see that Jesus is our greatest saviour. From that cosmic perspective on who Jesus is and what he has done, Paul zooms in on what that looks like for each one of us personally. Verse 21. See the wonderful transition? And you, and you, who were once alienated and hostile in your minds, doing evil deeds, 
he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And you... What he describes here is not just true of the Colossians, it's true of all those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus. And he explains how this makes a difference to our past and to our present and to our future. Our past, what we once were, verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He describes here how every one of us used to relate to God. It may not be that we were even aware of it at the time, but we can now see that this is what was going on in our hearts and minds. We were alienated. Perhaps you know what it's like to be a stranger in a foreign land. We use rarely, fortunately, that horrible word alien to describe someone who doesn't fit in. Often that is not a positive experience. Being sidelined, being ignored, perhaps worse. But that horrible experience is how we treated God. There's a spiritual distance between us and God. Perhaps we never give him much thought. How shocking that is when the one that we're not giving much thought to is the one in whom and through whom and for whom all things were created. The one in whom we depend on for our very existence. We were alienated but we're also hostile in mind. Perhaps that feels a bit strong don't most people just not care about God? <coughs> but apathy is soon revealed to be just skin deep when we realize that none of us like God telling us how to be, how to think, or how to run our lives. Overtly, or perhaps in more subtle ways, we resist God's authority and we reject his truth. We prefer a distorted image of God rather than the true God revealed to us in the Bible. But that is what we once were. We're also doing evil deeds. From that root of turning away from God, we end up acting in ways that are against his good and perfect ways. Even if we were brought up in a good, maybe even a Christian family. We lie, we cheat, we're selfish. So why does Paul mention all of this? It's because this is why we need saving. He's already called this existence the domain of darkness. It's a terrible existence. And it brings with it a terrible consequence because it cuts us off from God. The source of life and the results of doing that are death. But it also shows us that unless God did something about it, we were unwilling and unable to get ourselves out of this mess. That was our past, what we once were. But wonderfully, through Jesus, our present is all about reconciliation through Christ. Look at verse 20. Through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The whole point of realizing how lost I was is to appreciate how amazing it is to be found. And the good news is that Jesus Christ can address this problem of alienation and hostility and evil deeds and make us right with God. Jesus reconciles us to God. He brings peace instead of alienation and hostility, and he does it through his death on the cross. His death, although it's beyond our full comprehension, involves bearing the punishment for our sins. He did this for us without any assistance from us, without any cooperation from us. It was his doing, not ours. Only Jesus could do that. As the old hymn puts it, nothing in my hand I bring Simply to your cross, I cling. That's our present. Well, our future, that's the third place he takes us, is being presented before God. Look at verse 22. He's now reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Ultimately, getting right with God is a fact that assures us that one day we will be presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach before God. When will that be? It will be on that final judgment day when Jesus returns. 
This promise offers us hope and confidence in our salvation. It wasn't just Alan and Ritva who were married in this church. My wife and I were also married in this church 20 years ago this week. And there was a moment during the service that I remember very vividly. It's the part where I gave her the wedding ring. And the reason I remember it so clearly is that as soon as I said the words, all that I am I give to you and all that I have I share with you, the entire congregation burst into laughter. Why? Because they knew that I came with very few possessions into our married life. Not only that, I had loads of liabilities, lots of them. I was totally broke with no workable plan to pay my debts off. I had sold my car to my brother to help pay something towards the wedding. However, fortunately for me, I was marrying someone who was not in such a financial mess. And on the day we got married, my debt became her debt. Everything she had became ours. <laughs> a great deal for me. Perhaps less so for her. And that's why everyone found it so funny to hear me say these words. All that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. I could see why they laughed. It was quite funny. But for me, what was so amazing about all of that was to know that she knew all of that about me but loved me anyway. And that is a small picture of what it's like when we become Christians. Jesus takes our liabilities and gives us his assets. The most amazing thing is that he does know exactly what we are like, yet he still loves us. We were alienated, hostile to God in mind, doers of evil deeds. But Jesus willingly took those on and he offers to exchange them for everything he is and everything that he has. The words holy, and blameless and above reproach describe Jesus perfectly. And because of Jesus, they will describe us too, if we trust in him. Now I realize for some of us here this will be new, or perhaps raise a whole load of questions in your mind, and so you may find it helpful to join us for four Tuesday evenings, where we'll watch a short video and discuss these things together. It's a course called 321. It's an exploration of life according to Jesus. We meet Jesus, our guide, and let him show us what God is like. That's what the three is about. It shows us what the world is like. That's what the two is about. And it shows you what you are like. That is the one. And if you want to know more about what those numbers mean, then why not come along to 321? And we'll give you the details later in the service. But as we draw to a conclusion, the point of this passage, a reminder again, is that Jesus is incredible. He has rescued us in the most amazing way. He is the goat, the greatest of all time. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has done everything needed to rescue us. It tells us that Jesus is the only way we can be rescued. So trust him, trust him alone, look for nothing extra or other than Jesus for your salvation. Verse 23 again, do not shift from the hope of the gospel that you heard. And the big warning through the book of Colossians is that we need to watch out for weak alternatives to the true gospel. They often seem very spiritual, they promise to deliver, but they take us away from trusting in Jesus alone. It's as stupid as choosing the teaspoon, the tea-like candle, the tiny torch, or the plastic water pistol. But what might that look like in our lives? Some of you may know a book called How People Change by Timothy Lane and Paul Tripp. And in that book, they call this the gospel gap. And they give some little examples of people. I think these are made up examples, but perhaps they resonate with you. They talk about Jim. Jim is always at church events, involved in various activities, appears to be a committed member. However, none of that affects his heart, how he lives in, outside of church, how he relates to his saviour. His confidence is in what he does. They also talk about Sally, who lives by strict rules, expects others to do the same. She judges herself and others based on these rules and feels that obeying them earns her favor with God. Her confidence is in keeping the rules. Well, there's Christine, who's always chasing intense emotional experiences. She moves from one church to another, seeking spiritual highs. 
not realizing that real growth often occurs in the unspectacular everyday moments of life, not just in the dramatic spiritual highs, but her confidence is in how she feels. And Shirley, while she's passionate about various social causes, she believes that standing up for what is right defines Christianity. Fighting for justice and truth are good things, but they should be an outpouring of our faith, not a replacement for it. Her confidence is in standing up for what is right. And then there's John, the expert in theology and biblical knowledge. He's got a deep understanding of the Bible, but struggles to live out the grace that he knows about so well at least intellectually. In his case, the strong focus on studying the word of God has led to a lack of humility and grace in the way he interacts with others. His confidence is in what he knows. Now we'll come back to some of those challenges as we work our way through the book of Colossians. But the wonderful news of Christianity, the wonderful news of the gospel is that Jesus has done everything to rescue us. And it tells us that Jesus is the only way we can be rescued. So we must trust in him. We must trust in him alone. We're not to look for something extra or other than Jesus for our salvation. Jesus is amazing. And Jesus is enough. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the incredible gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for all he is, for all he has done for us. Thank you that he is the greatest in creation, the greatest in the church, the greatest savior. Help us to grasp how amazing he is, the depth of your love, and how incredible the reconciliation that we have through Jesus' death on the cross is. And Father, open our eyes to see the many distractions, the many alternatives that can lead us away from trusting in Jesus alone. And help us not to shift from the hope of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.